Talk about this IUL challenge, really, especially the timeline that we're in, why that's even more important than the challenge itself. Um, because just knowing that really sets the stage for how uh, yeah. quote unquote, dangerous these these products are and, and how they've been sold. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a couple components to it. One of the things that, that really, I guess I'll, I'll have to go back to what made me so passionate um, to make the pivot personally from IUL to Whole Life, and that was effectively writing policies that I was told were max efficient, were, you know, I was optimizing them to the best of my ability as an agent. And and so like, cause there's a lot of agents that say, well, as long as you design them properly, they're going to be fine. Well, no, that's not true. You know, like they may not blow up. They may not lapse. You may not have like a catastrophic issue, but if you're selling somebody a product with the goal of tax-free retirement income. And let's say you illustrated it 50,000 a year tax-free retirement income, but then based on the actual performance of the policy, they're only able to pull out 20,000 a year tax-free income. If they're relying on that extra income, you've hurt them because it's about expectations and it's about the stability and the security, because let's face it, they're sold as 401k alternatives, right? Or rich man Roths, right? That's, yep. that's how they're positioned in the marketplace. And that is my problem within universal life. And so I realized that like that and, and full transparency, man, that is the story I was selling when I was selling these things because I didn't know what I didn't know. You know what I mean? But then when you start to see how they actually perform long term, for me, I'm, I'm somebody who when I realize a different truth, like or, or like I realize I'm wrong, I will admit it. I'll take my medicine. I'll, I'll educate myself and I'll pivot. And I had to have a lot of really hard conversations with high level clients and friends and family that I put into, you know, like it was. Yeah. But, I was willing to do that. I had to do that. It, my integrity required me to do that. And so, you and know, sure they respect you more for it now. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple really, a couple conversations that were pretty <laughs> tough, because, you know? Yeah. I mean, cause I pushed pretty hard on the benefits of it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, then they're like, but Chris, like, this is like the opposite of what you were saying 18 months ago. And now, you know, and it was pretty hard because if you know anything about IUL, like the surrender cycle of these at the beginning in the horrible. first 18 to 24 months are horrible. And so I was like a couple, couple people, I was like, you basically got to walk away from 20 grand that you put into this policy and it's my fault. <laughs> like mm. that's, that's hard to do. That's yeah. hard to do. But I could show them how over the next 10 years it made sense, you know? And so, um, was what it was, but, um, when I moved to the whole life space, you know, I guess, you know, that was the 20 end of 2014. And ultimately, uh, when, when I, when I look at the IUL challenge, why I've created it and is because during the past, let's just call it decade, um, really index universal life, I guess let's do a little quick history lesson on IUL. Everybody likes to be like index universal life is, is 25 years old because it was created by trans America in 1997. And yes, it was. And that is true. It's a factual statement. IUL was created in 1997 by trans America, but until 2009, Index Universal Life had virtually zero market share of permanent life insurance. Like if you look at permanent life insurance from the GUL perspective, the whole life, the UL, the traditional UL, not IUL, but traditional UL, um, and, and the VUL space, if you looked at those four and then you threw Index Universal Life in as like the fifth component to it, IUL had no, like literally virtually no market share, under 1% market share until 2009. All right, and then what happened was 2009, it shot through the roof because of the story of upside potential and downside protection coming out of the great recession. Yeah, it made sense, right? And so, and that's, by the way, I joined the industry in 2009, right? So like for me, it was like, hey, I bought into a hook, line, sinker. That's kind of my story. But then what happened was we had cap rates go from 16 and a half percent all the way down to like 12 and a half percent at the time. Uh, and um, now they oh, dropped to like nine to nine and a half percent. From 09 to 2014, 2014. Okay. Yeah. They dropped to like 12 and a half and now they're down to, let's say nine, nine and a half, sometimes eight and a half percent, depending on the carrier. But I think let's just call it between nine and 10% is where most cap rates are at this point in time for most companies, any company with any kind of legitimacy, in my opinion, as of, um, <clears throat> as of right now, today in 2022. Okay. Yep. And so we, we, people, the, the reason I started, I guess, to get right to it is the reason I started the IUL challenge is to me, it's a, it's a life insurance product sold on upside potential, downside protection, participation in the markets, right in through the, the purchasing of options index, right? So like, it sounds really good, 
but when you when you look at it and you understand like okay let's just let's just for the simplicity component of this let's just call it the s p 500 index right now there are other indexes there are other proprietary indexes there are all sorts of different ways to go about it but let's just for simplicity's sake let's say they're they're participating in the s p 500 index so over the past decade we look at this and we go well I mean, you can talk to anybody and it's like the S&P 500 has had the best decade literally of all time, right? Correct. So from from after the crash to 2020 yeah. before COVID, best best right. time ever to Heck, like, you could even say you could even say right through now. I mean, we the, oh, okay. well up until okay. up until January 2022 cuz we had that dip in COVID, right? right. Like at the beginning of COVID. But it really but it recovered was, fast. It just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Got gotcha. right back up, right? And and to that point, Denzel, what would happen is the all the IUL people would be like, you see that 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 dip at that moment, you were protected, right? Like so that that kind of added to their story in a way, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is I knew that we had the greatest bull run of all time in the S&P 500, and that all these products that were selling IULs participating in the S&P 500 index underperformed what they actually were illustrated to perform. And so people go, well, how could that be? Yeah. It, it just makes no sense. I mean, how, how is that possible, it? right? Like totally. nothing totally. but gains, yet when you look at the totally. internal rate of return on my cash value, it's not even yeah. equal to what was originally illustrated. And most agents know that illustrations are conservative, not even like yeah. above what it could potentially do. So we're talking an illustration that tends to run on conservative numbers. And so you're telling me I didn't even do conservatively good in the best like you said, bull run in the history of the United States. Exactly. Yes. And that that's the challenge. These these agents like to say that it's done, that that uh, that these are conservative assumptions based on everything. And the, the reality is they're, they're anything but conservative. And and if you go back through history and so this is this is the thing I I'm, I'm a you, you call yourself a geek about this stuff, right? Like I, I do too. I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. I'm a, like, I, I, I am. I just, I love this stuff. My, my wife picks on me about it all the time, but like, I'm obsessed with how these things work. Right. And, and, and the history, if you look at it, so before 2015, the IUL space was completely the wild, wild west. You could literally create illustrations with nine and a half percent assumptions, 9.1, 8.9% 8 assumptions. And then you could wow. bake in, in the illustration, positive arbitrage of up to 3%, 3 percent, three like three percent arbitrage on policy loans it's it was it was mm. like insane and, and you can imagine what that does to the illustrative performance on how agents are selling these and so the regulators said whoa 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 that's enough is enough we're going to create a regulation that reigns in how people can illustrate these things because it's out of control and so in 2015 they created what's called regulation ag49 so regulation ag49 was created and what that did is it took companies and it 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 put handcuffs on them on their ability to illustrate with the the big arbitrage numbers because they were doing three percent it took uh and it eliminated their ability to uh to illustrate at the astronomical levels they they implemented what's called the hypothetical hypothetical look back test so what they would do is they look back and that's what uh instead of being able to say, hey, we're going to illustrate it at 9.1 or 8.5 or 9.5 or whatever the number that the agent wanted to kind of populate in there for to, to create a result in the illustration, the regulator said, no, based on the index that you're using, the cap rates, there's going to be this algorithm that says you're allowed to run it at this percentage, right? So AG49 was supposed to kind of rein in all this recklessness. The problem is when they did that, the, the companies were looking and they go, well, wow, the, these things don't perform the way that we thought they would. So they had to get creative. They started creating multipliers. They started doing a bunch of different things um, to counter AG49. So Pack Life is kind of like the, the, the poster child for this operation. They kind of led the charge on this. And they started doing these multipliers and doing these other riders on the policy that you could add on the policies to make it so you could basically buy the performance illustrated we illustrated performance in the policy so they still illustrated well and they still looked really attractive but it didn't change the fact that they weren't going to perform and if you understand um it, well I, i'll say it this way they could perform technically speaking i don't want to say they can't perform because they could if, if the environment lined up perfectly for them which it doesn't 99 percent of the time but here's the deal 
When we think about why people buy Index Universal Life, it's based on the story that they're sold of upside potential, downside protection. You can't lose your money. You can't lose this. You can't like it, you're so protected. You're guaranteed growth, all these different things. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is not the way these things work. That's how they're sold. And so the thing with multipliers and when you added in all these other components to it, what happened is, you know, these the uh, you're basically injecting more risk into a product that people are buying for perce perceived safety, right? Like it just, right. it, 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 there's such a disconnection. And so then what happened is that ha that went on for five years or so. And then in, tw in, in December of 2020, regulators said, okay, enough is enough. Uh, we're gonna create regulation AG49A. We're gonna amend and update regulation AG49. And they basically put a restriction on what they could do with multipliers and all these other riders and moving parts. That's where things kind of got nuts. Um, and, and you'll see now that's where uh, a lot of these companies go, oh, well, now we have uncapped index participation. We have uh, proprietary indexes that are like cherry picked. Those two things were a, a response from the companies and they only created those because they had to to be able to have the the illustrations perform in a way that they could go out and sell them but the bottom line is you know you're if you understand how iuls work then you understand that it doesn't matter if we have s p 500 is the index that we're participating in it doesn't matter if the if the cap rate um the, well let me say it this way there's a lot of different moving parts if it's an uncapped there's going to be participation rates or there's going to be spread charges if it if it is a capped rate there's going to be a cap rate and participating uh par rates that they're that that can be manipulated um or changed based on the needs of the company at the end of the day you're dealing with an options budget and you're dealing with options costs those are the things that drive what the actual performance of the index is and that is where kind of lies the problem with iul and why they've not performed over the past decade during the greatest boom that the s p has ever seen is because of the fact that during this boom what's happened is fixed rates have gone down right? The fixed performance of the general fund of these insurance companies have gone down. So what we've seen is a reduction in the options budget. And what's happened there at the same time is that because more and more companies have gotten into the IUL space, A, and B, that there's been more volatility in the market. And C, we've had a lot more day traders, that whole space is picked up. And so now what we have is we have a lot more competition in the options markets. And so the cost of options has gone up. Right. And so when we look at these things and we say, well, the options budget's gone down, the options costs have gone up. So it doesn't matter that the that the uh, that the S&P has gone through this great bull run because it, you're not really that that's not the the component that drives the performance in an IUL policy. The real two components that drive the performance in your policy is the options budget and the options costs, because that's what's going to dictate what you're able to actually participate with inside of the index performance. Does that make sense? That does. I know it's a lot.